62, I had a chance to go to the M&W Gear Show in, in uh, Gibson City, Illinois. And at that show, they had some, they had a yellow and a red framed 706 there. In fact, I think the company had several of them, but, but uh, they had them up on stands and then had voting uh, little cards of the, in fact, this picture right here was one of the voting, or the ballots, and people would vote to uh, see whether they wanted to come with a red frame tractor or the brown frame tractor. Later on, after we got back from the show, we decided we were going to have an open house in the spring, and we were able to get that red tractor to come out to Sydney. And uh, while it was sitting there at the open house, a fellow by the name of John Shaw, the old Grandpa John is what everybody called him, came to the, uh, to the, came to the open house and he saw this tractor. And during open houses, you're always busy with people wanting to visit. And Grandpa come walking into Dad's office and he says, Poland, I want to buy that red tractor out there and a new six bottom plow. Dad said, John, I don't know whether I can sell you that red tractor or not. And he says, if you can't sell me that red one, I ain't going to buy one. So Dad sold it to him. And then he called Omaha to see what he needed to do to, to buy that special show tractor. And he had quite a time talking them out of it. He said, well, why don't you just paint another one red? And they said, well, why don't you paint one red? So there was a catch-22 going on there. But this is the actual tractor that, was, that uh, Grandpa John bought. And we finally got it back in the original state. Uh, you can see that the red paint is quite faded now. And I, I think probably the best thing to do is just kind of leave it the way it is. There's an interesting story about Grandpa John. Uh, one summer, about the first of, latter part of June, first part of July, John came, and his son John and, and uh, grandson Jack came in, and I was working the parts counter, and they had been making the rounds of the implement places to get all their supplies for for uh, wheat harvest that year, but they usually didn't cut up there till about the, oh, somewhere between the 1st and the 10th of August. And I couldn't understand why Grandpa John was in such an uproar. He was just wanting to get all those repairs and get back home and get the combines ready. And I really couldn't understand what his big rush was. And then there was something they said, well, we got to get ready because I want to go fishing. And I thought, well, gosh, you got to get the wheat cut before you go fishing. But I didn't say anything. So after they left, I went over and I said, Dad, what in the devil was going on with Grandpa John? He was just really irate at those guys because they weren't hurrying and getting the stuff. They didn't have everything written down that they were supposed to get. And uh, he says, you don't understand. John wanted to go home get the combines all ready, make sure they were ready, and drive them down to the first field that was going to be ready to cut, and then run them again and make sure they were ready, and then they were going to go fishing for 10 days, and when they came back, <laughs> the wheat would be ready, and they'd be ready to go and be no breakdowns. They wouldn't be fooling around trying to patch and green wheat. It would all be right. So that was why John was so irate about getting things ready because he wanted to go fishing. Hello folks, we're, today we're in Gearing, Nebraska at the 208 Winter Prairie Gold Rush Convention. And we've been describing some of the trials and tribulations of putting mechanical front wheel assists under Minneapolis Moline tractors. This, uh, this 706 that I'm standing beside here, the uh, the transfer case that's hanging down here is the gear reduction to match the transmission to the rear wheels and to the front axle. And it's a triple chain uh, gearbox with a big sprocket on the bottom, but a little sprocket on the top. The, uh, the dry line comes on front. 
and uh, powers the front wheels. When I was installing these things, the bolts that hold this front saddle uh, had to be drilled up into the frame. Actually, the, the standard front axle bolted way up here under the radiator and we needed to shorten the tractor up to uh, make it steer a little bit shorter and especially with this front wheel drive axle because the, the due to the, the universal joints you couldn't get near the steering angle out of them. Anyway I would roll this whole front end under here vice grip that plate to the frame jack it back up take the front axle out get a half inch drill and, and uh, put a, a jack under the drill and one of us would hold the drill and one of us would jack and we'd just use a almost an inverted drill press to drill the two holes on this side and the two holes on the other side. The, uh, the tin cover that we will be showing later on through the, through the film is this little piece of tin right here. That that was the final final piece that went on and it just covered up all the all of the, the hole that was that was cut into the transmission case. What we have here is the templates that we used to go up in the clutch housing and saw a hole for the the front wheel assist transfer case and this is the hole that was that came out of the clutch housing after it was finished sawing. These are the actual templates that we used. This one was for the tractor that had 18434 tires on it and this was for the one that had 1826 or 23126 tires. This is the upper counter shaft uh, or the, the uh, third shaft off to the side and this this shaft is replaced in, and we put one like this in there with the extension coming into the clutch housing and it came through a uh, reworked front cover with an oil seal in it so this could pr protrude and still seal the oil up. Okay Kenny are you saying that the the shaft is the shaft is a piece of the attachment. Okay. Yeah and, and, we and actually replaced that shaft. Okay you replaced the original shaft. Original shaft. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that splined sprocket of that chain coupler right there goes on the end of the shaft. The other sprocket went on the end of the transfer case and then the chain coupler went around the outside of it. It was, it was difficult to get both of those sprockets lined up well because you had to have them parallel and also front to back or side to side and up to, up and down and we did that by shimming the transfer case into the boss on the tractor. The uh, clutch cover had to have a pipe coupling welded in it for the grease tube for the clutch collar where that was originally is, is right right there on that chain coupling and you just had to, had to virtually move it. Uh, let's see, this bar right here was a kind of a crowbar affair and, and it uh, was mainly used to reach up in and knock the tabs loose or straighten the tabs out on the uh, lock bolts that were in the back end of the counter shaft here. And that those bolts pulled that shaft clear back and held it, held it in the tractor. The other rod was a rod that was used to drive the shaft forward and there's a little center hole a lay, center hole in the end of the shaft and that, that rod has a little bit of a point on it and you could line it up or poke it in that hole, smack the back end of this thing with a, sh with a hammer, drive that shaft clear into the clutch housing and you tried to keep tried to drive the shaft clear on through the back gear and the back back spacer on the upper counter shaft to hold it and if it fell out then you had to do an awful lot of 
fooling around to get that uh, the uh, the uh, gear that rides right here on the shaft and that spacer right there on the shaft. And we did that through the belt pulley hole. So reaching up in there with your fingers and having someone else pushing on the shaft trying to get it in there was kind of dangerous business. You had to be very careful that you didn't pinch somebody's finger or your own finger. The uh, big saber saw here was what was used to saw this hole out. Basically we bolt this up under the tractor with these two guide holes and I usually just drilled the corners and then took a center punch and punched in the rest of the hole so I'd have a line to, to uh, guide me with the saw. And it took about two hours and about six blades to do that, that amount of sawing. There was the, the saber saw all by itself there that you see really wouldn't work and we have a rheostat or a speed control on the saw and run it about a third of the speed and that seemed to work real well for sawing cast iron. After everything is completely assembled, this little tin shield goes around the transfer case and, and covers up the hole. Lauren, I don't know uh, what else you would like to talk about here. Well, thank you, Kenny. You betcha. And we'll go on to something else. And, he said and the wishbone was separate. He lived over the transfer the case he said during the war, he said was, uh, junk it out. was separate, and then the drive shaft. Yeah. And then these pieces here are just, just this is the axle, the long, I think this is the short axle. And there's a long one in there too. And then you've got this shaft that had to be changed. And this that is, was in the transmission. Yeah, and then this is the chain coupler that hooks oh, this okay. into the shaft up to that transfer case. And uh, the old uh, bearing support for that shaft was drilled out with a seal in it so that shaft could come on into the clutch housing. Okay. And this is the, this is the hole that was cut out of the clutch housing to receive the transfer case. These were our templates that we used to get lined up. Uh, these two bolts are part of the tractor. I just bolted that up there. and I generally just would center punch four holes in the corner later on and then center punch a few across so I'd have some somewhere to make the follow a line to come across that hole. And that usually took oh about an hour and a half to saw that hole. Out. Okay, so these bolted up underneath where the wishbone bolts, not off the side like the factory ones. No, it bolts up just like it was just like that one. Oh, was okay. Yeah, yeah. That kit under that tractor is exactly the same kit that's under that. Uh, the engineers at Minneapolis didn't think this was going to work. And that's why they didn't do it. And it was difficult because... So what engineers did do? Well, <laughs> the reason they didn't like it was they were taking this machine surface right here, and that surface on the tractor is real rough. The uh, alignment of these two sprockets has got to be very, very critical. And when you put that case up in there, you lay your fingers across the bottoms of the sprockets. As soon as you can get your finger all the way around to lay in there, then you can roll the coupler chain on it. Till those sprockets are, are aligned perfectly, you won't be able to put that pin in. <laughs> and, uh, and you'd have a shimmy the, the case? Yeah, and that's, that's what this pile of washers is for. <laughs> Uh, when when the company decided to do that, they uh, when they cast the transmissions, they cast the hole open, mm -hmm. and then they machined that pad across there. Mm -hmm. That made putting that transfer case up under there and lining the sprockets up a whole bunch easier. Mm -hmm. Then the the uh, clutch collar grease tube. There there wasn't room for that tube in there anymore because it came out real, real close to where this transfer case goes up in there. Okay. So there's about 
As soon as we figured out how to put them on and, and put that shaft in by just going through the belt pulling hole, that saved a lot of work because originally we had to take the fuel tank, the whole dash panel off there to get the top off the transmission and then uh, uh, change that shaft and then put it all back together. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lauren, I didn't mean to leave that book lay right in front of you. That's all right. Someone was asking just a minute ago the price of these things. The uh, standard G6 kit was $19.95 and it, uh, I think I got $125 for installing it. About eight to ten hours worth of work. But back in the day when you were making a dollar a month, <laughs> it was almost that bad most of the time, Curtis. <laughs> there were no, there weren't very many of these nice repair shops like this now, to work out. Of. Now were a lot of people doing this, or did was this done more in your area than other areas? Curtis, I think, I think we probably put more of them on the standard tractor than uh, anywhere else. Uh, I kind of started doing this in the spring of 61 after Lloyd Erickson and, and uh, Dick Pettigrew came out and showed us how to do it. And then I went down through the western edge of Kansas and eastern Colorado and put some on. The Dominican Republic uprising started and about August of 61, Dad said, you better get your ass back in school or you're going to the Army. <laughs> so then through the winter and fall of 61, then this thing really busted loose. Uh, the territory people were always uh, the ones in Wichita and the, the eastern edge was wondering where in the hell we were getting all these good tractors and they were calling them G9s. And <laughs> I don't know where they came up with that number, but, but anyway, uh, uh, that winter then it kind of really busted loose and Dad was in the Red River of North Dakota and Santa Maria in California and Stockton and, and the uh, San Joaquin Valley and El Centro in Southern California. And the big ones there were the M5s, row crop tractors, because of the vegetable growing. The, uh, and they had the right wheel spacing for that, or are you, they just you got know, lucky? <laughs> no, it was possible to get the right wheel spacing moving the wheels around. Uh, you know, I think that one's pretty close to 60 inches now, isn't it? Aren't, aren't these? No, what is that? What do you think that is, Laura? What was a G6 wheel spacing? Were they about... 80 inches or something like that. It didn't seem to make much difference. Right on 60. Okay. So it came awful close for the row crops. And then you have to remember back in those days, 30 inches was just coming in. But most of those places were in that vegetable stuff were in a lot narrower rows. But they liked the M5 on potato harvesters and, and those kinds of things. The M5 hookup is quite a lot different because it goes through that that uh, front power takeoff hole. It's in there, and it works in every gear but fifth, which was nice because you, in road gear it, you could shift it out. Curtis, I can't think of a whole lot of stuff to tell you about this anymore because it's been a long time ago. And I don't remember a whole lot. Well, I mean, other they just make the tractor more efficient. Or was there, was there soils that was tough to get through on two-wheel drive? You know, if you have uh, good traction capabilities, the front wheel assist is not such a big deal other than you don't have to use the brakes to go around the corner. As that thing really shines is when you get into real loose conditions. Then they really work. And then, then when you come to the end, you don't have to stand on the brakes to get one to come around. Braking, steering brakes on these tractors was a death of them because we were knocking bull gears and brake shafts and that kind of stuff out. They were so heavy that they didn't want to turn. With the front wheel assist, and that you know, helped that situation a whole bunch. Got it. 
the uh, and, uh, then so then in the that was 61 then in uh, kind of the winter of 60 beginning of 62 then uh, Bill Pringle was able to get the engineers convinced that maybe they should build some of these in Minneapolis and uh, Lloyd told me that that first 70 they ordered 75 kits from Bill and Lloyd said I was making trips into Chicago trying to get axles <laughs> from those surplus places and he said we generally only got two, two out of three were good ones and they had to tear them all apart and weld the pads and stuff on them. Oh, they were used then? Yeah, yeah, they were surplus axles. Mm -hmm. So he'd get them well, home. Some surplus can be new. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think I don't think these guys were giving Sweet all the good stuff. <laughs> anyway, they built the 704, mm -hmm. and then uh, that was just a stopgap thing that they were then becoming getting ready to put the 504 engine in and a tractor along with front wheel assist to come out with the 705 and 706. When that happened, the the uh, overrun of G6s that were still left in the field, we had a chance to sell front axles for those, but then it was pretty short lived and by 63 or 64 we were kind of clear out of the business then. So these preceded the higher horsepower tractors, <laughs> yeah. it wasn't necessarily because we finally got the 800 horse that oh, this no. became necessary. No, uh -uh. Okay. But then the Europeans were way out ahead of us on this stuff. They had front wheel assist tractors there a long time ago. And I do have some pictures at home of some old steam tractors that had front wheel assist on them. Okay. <laughs> so it's not, a, it's not a new thing by any means. It was just a matter of trying to get everything engineered and tried to make it work. Yeah, I'm okay here. Okay, now. Is that Philip just... Oh, did I, move, I mess you up? No, that's all right. I was just taking a picture of it. Uh, Why don't you turn around so you get your hand out of the way? Well, as soon as he gets that out of there, I just want to show you now what we're going to do. Okay. I'm going to stick this rod in the end of that shaft like that, and we're going to drive that shaft forward out of the transmission okay. into the clutch housing and try to keep this going right on into the transmission and catch the gears on this shaft so when we go back together, we won't have to do so much fishing to get it hooked back up. Okay. I think by the name of Kennedy built those. He was north of Sydney and he built them for Minneapolis Marine Tractor. Okay. They look a lot yeah. like this one, Phil. Yeah. Yeah, the G has got one and that U has got one. Mm -hmm. Those two. And then the G6 beside it, I think that was somewhat of a fat, that was sort of that tall factory cab on that G6. But the other two are homemade cabs. And I thought, I, I've got the history for. For all those tractors, for a good share of that I got in that, uh, uh, and I'm pretty sure that this guy had a name of Kennedy down there because he wanted to. Well, there was one paper guy here already. I think he was from. Yeah, he was from the Star Herald.